Thanks, Richard. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, I was here last summer. I also came and gave a similar chat about offshore wind or about wind in general. But so the movie, um, I haven't seen the movie either. So um, my understanding is from what, what Richard said, it's about a young boy who uses science uh, to overcome a challenge uh, that they're facing in, that, in their village. And in this case, uh, uh, it has to do with, a, I believe, a drought and uh, using harnessing the wind to pump uh, water and to irrigate, uh, irrigate the fields. Um, and in, in so doing so, he meets a lot of resistance, a lot of skepticism, you know, whether it's from his father or from the community about what he's doing and will it work. Uh, but he shows a lot of perseverance, uh, you know, to solve that problem and kind of brings the community together. Um, you know, it wasn't so hard for me to kind of draw the, uh, the, draw the analogy of what we're facing on Martha's Vineyard or especially in the United States right now in, in, uh, in regards to the development of offshore wind. Obviously, uh, in some circles, a pretty controversial topic. It's big change. Um, on Martha's Vineyard, we've come together as a community to kind of influence that process. Um, Richard said, uh, he introduced me as the president of Vineyard Power. Um, we're a cooperative on the island. Uh, is, are there members of the cooperative in the audience? Is, uh, I see one member here. There's three and a half thousand members, uh, two, thank you. Uh, three and a half thousand members uh, on the island. And we were formed about 10 years ago to come together to kind of address how would we as a community kind of be involved in the development of offshore wind. Uh, so um, that, that's where we came from. So where, you know, where I started and where the science comes into it, I carry around my little climate card, which is uh, something to help uh, me remind me of what I'm doing this for. Um, but about climate change and the climate crisis, uh, you know, there's not much, uh, you know, I think it's 99% of scientists now uh, associate the climate disruption we're going through to man-made releases of carbon dioxide. And a lot of times we hear things like, well, carbon dioxide has been up and down through the history of the earth, right? You, you hear that a lot. It, it's, it's true. And on this side uh, of this, it's maybe hard to see, but it's a graph that goes up, up and down. Um, well, let me see, it's on this side, up and down. So carbon has been going up and down, carbon dioxide on the planet for the last, uh, well, since the planet's been around about four billion years ago. But over the last million years, it's been hovering between 200 and 300 parts per million. Uh, is that, that's the range. Um, and just to get a sense of people, just how long humans have been on the planet? Anybody just care to, out of the million years I just mentioned? Uh, well, it's only a, a, a little over 100,000 years, right? So we've really been here a short period of time over that, that period. And we've been over here during a period of time when it was pretty low carbon and a, and a warming planet. What this shows here is since the Industrial Revolution, that line goes up dramatically. Um, yesterday, the reading in the um, Climate Station in Hawaii uh, reports of uh, parts per million of 417 uh, of CO2. So remember, 200 to 300, 420 now. This is um, levels that have not been seen in millions of years on the planet. That's just to kind of put this in perspective. It's not something that uh, we've ever, ever experienced. On this side is just the correlation of CO2 and its correlation to temperature. And you can see it looks like one line. In other words, the temperature on the planet is absolutely directly related to the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, so that's our science problem. You know, how do we solve that problem as humankind? Um, because of the, um, the effects of this are going to be pretty catastrophic. And in this movie, maybe one of the effects is uh, the drought. <laughs> but there are going to be more droughts. Um, Martha's Vineyard has increased in temperature since 1900. And this was something that was just reported through the United States, uh, through the uh, NOAA. NOAA. Um, they just reported. Does anyone care to guess how hard Martha's Vineyard has heated in, since 1900, the average temperature here? Any care to guess on that? Say it's one degree Fahrenheit. So, oh, no, sorry, one degree centigrade. It's almost two degrees uh, Fahrenheit has gone up. So that's just since 1900. Our average temperature has gone up almost uh, two degrees Fahrenheit here. Um, you hear a lot of stories from a lot of the old timers here. They used to do like a lot of ice racing on the ponds, the Tisbury Great Ponds and the Chilmark Ponds. That's almost a thing of the past that's not, not, not returning. So we're warmer. We've also, our sea level's risen as well. Um, sea level right here in Vineyard Haven Harbor has gone up almost a foot since 1900. And out of that uh, rise, uh, four inches have happened since 1990. So it's been rapidly expanding. And I just can't help notice over the last 20 years how five corners and all this road floods at the smallest of rain now 
Um, so what they're predicting with this 420 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a further warming of the planet. Uh, Martha's Vineyard would be expected to go up another two degrees by 2050 and another uh, a foot of sea level rise somewhere between 2050 and 2100. So we're very vulnerable to that on the island. I mean, all coastal communities are pretty, pretty vulnerable to that. In fact, 120 million Americans live in a county that borders up the coast. So you know, a lot, you know, you hear that all the time. Uh, most of the people that we uh, in the country live on the coast, and in fact, that's the, the situation around the world. So that's the crisis, and using science to fix that, that's what we're doing with offshore wind. Currently, offshore wind is planned on the south uh, of Martha's Vineyard, about 14 miles offshore. Uh, there's currently, right now, about five projects uh, in, in, in development. The project that Vineyard Power is working with uh, is due to be the first one, but it's the first of several that are coming. Um, and it's something that the state of Massachusetts and the federal government, under multiple administrations, is committed to. So using science, uh, to recognize the threat of climate change and then harnessing the wind to, to solve that problem. Wind is really the only renewable resource we have to actually solve this. We do a lot with solar here. We've got to continue to do more with solar and, and you know, encourage people to put solar on their roofs. But solar in the state of Massachusetts is, is only could do so much. We're about 35th in the country as far as the solar uh, capability. You know, it's not the sunniest place. But we do really well. We're in the top 10 in solar um, uh, installations in the country. So, you know, we punch above our weight class. But the real resource here is, is offshore wind. And every part of the country is going to have their own solution. You know, southwest and the south is mostly going to be solar. The northeast is going to be a combination of offshore wind and hydro. The Pacific Northwest will be probably a lot of hydro. But every region is going to have its solution. Our solution is offshore wind. So we're going to harness the wind. It's something we've been familiar with for millennia as humans, but also around here with sailboats and sailing. We grist mills to grind our grain, and uh, we've also um, used to use a lot of windmills up and down the coast of Cape Cod to produce salt. Uh, you can read a lot about that the subject. There would be windmills from Falmouth, Falmouth Heights all the way out to Yarmouth, just pumping water out of the ocean to make salt. So we're familiar with uh, the technology. Where it's changed over the last few years is the machines have gotten bigger, so you don't need as many of them and you can place them further and further offshore, which uh, obviously was a concern to a lot of people about how close these uh, turbines were to shore. Number one, for visual impact, but also uh, effects on birds and, and other kind of conflicts with, uh, with boating and stuff. So trying to push them as far as you can offshore. They're bigger, they're taller, and you just don't need as many of them. Um, our project that we're working on is going to produce about 6% of the state's electricity demand. It's for very, you know, very large uh, production. The second project is going to be another 6%. So Massachusetts is, due, uh, is uh, on track to get 12% of its electricity from offshore wind in the next five years. And, and then that's just the beginning of it. So uh, the capability out there is, to, uh, is enough to almost produce 100% of our electricity. Finally, where do you go when you green the grid with solar and wind? You then move towards electrification of everything else, which means electrification of your cars. So um, we, we, have, we have, my, my colleague Eric, who's here, gave a talk last yesterday at the West Tisbury Library, all about the electrification of transportation. The next one is going to be at Oak Bluffs. Is Oak Bluffs, uh, not this Saturday, but the following Saturday at 2.30 p.m. So it'll, it'll be a repeat of that discussion about the electrification of transport. Gets involved in electric vehicles, uh, what's on the market, the incentives, and so forth. But also other things like ferries, electrification of our ferries, work with the steamship authority to do that. Um, but it gets into the whole subject, of that, which is good. And then finally, after you electrify your transportation, the next thing is to electrify your home heating and cooling. And lots of people in this room, I'm already sure, are doing electric heat pumps. They're even more efficient now than putting in propane. So the electrification of our, of our economy is coming, and it's based on the backbone of, uh, of offshore wind in our region. So that's um, my comments and my questions. I'm happy, as Richard said, to take any questions. Um, but coming back to the movie, I think it's, again, about using science to address a problem, harnessing a natural resource, um, and the story that that entails. So, Another question here. Use this mic, please. Will the vineyard benefit from the offshore wind? It's a great question. So Vineyard Power is a cooperative. The reason we formed the cooperative was to make sure that whoever developed offshore wind 
gave us community benefits back on the island. So the biggest benefits uh, that we can uh, receive is the jobs that come from uh, the development of offshore wind. Richard mentioned something to me upstairs when we were talking about one thing about renewable energy, and you'll see it in this movie, is you can localize it, right? It's not something happening way, way, way far away. So for us, it was about jobs. When you construct the wind farm project that we're involved in, there's going to be about approaching a thousand construction workers over a two-year period working uh, in New Bedford and out at sea building the wind farm. But once they're done, they go on to build the next project. What they leave behind is something like 50 jobs uh, that are wind farm technicians and support staff. And what we negotiated with the project is we are going to base that uh, operations and maintenance facility in, uh, across the street right here in Vineyard Haven Harbor. Uh, we have an, uh, a lease uh, with the major landowner over there, which is R.M. Packer and Company. And we're going to build a $15 million operations and maintenance training center and uh, facility. Now, to go alongside that, we have to hire 50 people on the island to work in that. Uh, currently at the high school, uh, we're running a class through ASMV, Adult Community Education of Martha's Vineyard. We have 20 students enrolled in that class that are taking their first courses in becoming an electrical technician for offshore wind. So that's one of the big benefits we're going to get, and that's really a big economic stimulus. One thing we do find on the island is those year-round, well-paid jobs are harder and harder to come by. You know, if you're not a teacher or a police officer or working in a hospital, those are three real big examples. But after that, um, we're a very seasonal economy. So this is a year-round, good middle-class jobs, and we're already training up the first 20 of them. Um, there's other benefits too, uh, but I'll just let me say two other things. The Vineyard Wind Project committed to give uh, the island about seven and a half million dollars that we're going to use to develop solar and battery storage projects. And the principle behind those is to do them on uh, public service buildings. So when we do have big disruptions, we can have battery storage to run our police, our EMT, our town buildings, maybe Malthus Vineyard Community Services as an example, some of those. Um, so those are just two benefits uh, that are pretty, pretty deliverable. One of the things about this region is as the global warming takes hold and, and accelerates, we're going to get warmer here, obviously, but we're going to get much more uh, nor'easters and, and hurricanes. That's the prediction. A lot more rain, a lot more hurricanes. So um, we need to be more resilient. Uh, you want another question? What about electricity? I just saw my bill. I almost passed out. Yeah. We're not heating the yeah. whole house. No, it's really because nice. We lived in Connecticut. We used to compare the prices, and they're expensive, but not like here. That's true. Um, well, the two projects that have been approved from Massachusetts, um, they had to do a study on those projects, the, the, the prices that were submitted. Uh, the first project, the one we're involved in, was a, um, estimated a $1.6 million saving, uh, sorry, $1.6 billion savings to ratepayers. The second project was a $2 billion savings to ratepayers. Now, what that means to us in the room, it, we are going to save about 1% of our electricity bill compared to doing nothing. So it's not the greatest, but it is a savings. It's not paying more. We're taking carbon out. And the one thing about these uh, contracts are, they're stable prices over time. You know, they don't kind of fluctuate like gas. So the answer is a savings, but, um, you know, so we're not, we're, we're not paying a penalty for it. And the high prices is just the nature of uh, being in Massachusetts in the markets here. Anything Any else? other questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much for just letting me introduce this. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much.